Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Python Interoperability, uh, subtitled Building a Python-First Petabyte Scale Database. Um, so my name is William Gilltree. I've been a C++ developer for more than 20 years, and for more than half of that time, I've been a member of the C++ Standardization Committee. Uh, I've kind of worked all around in different areas of finance. I worked inside an exchange, uh, pushing data out. Um, I've worked in uh, risk analytics on the buy side in, apparently I'm short, <laughs> um, uh, on the buy side in a hedge fund, on what's called the sell side in investment banking. And over that time, I've worked on a whole you know, range of different proprietary time series databases. Um, and I'm now the lead architect on a project called Arctic DB, which is a Python first data frame database and is a uh, subject of a um, of an open source collaboration between Mann Group and, and Bloomberg. And our aim really is to be nothing more, nothing less than the fastest and the most intuitive way to work with really big data frame and time series data from Python. Uh, so the image in the background, recently my son who was 13 was playing around with stable diffusion and was training Laura's on uh, images of forests uh, but particularly on uh, images of forests and uh, mycorrhizal networks that live underneath the soil. Um, uh, these are the kind of fungal networks that the trees use to sort of send chemicals to each other. They share nutrients. Arguably, they also communicate with each other and, you know, alert and things like that. The science on that is not entirely settled. Um, which wasn't entirely accidental because uh, my father had just visited and uh, besides being an all-round uh, cool guy, he is also a biochemist and he was the author of, or one of the authors of the first paper that demonstrated that plants do in fact sort of exchange nutrients and information uh, using these fungal networks. And it seemed to me that this is a really great analogy for the way that... Um, you know, the way that the Python world works in that we live in this sort of Python forest and there's all these beautiful you know, environmental objects that you can see, but there's also this really kind of fascinating thing going on underneath the ground, and that is the kind of C API and all of the C-based functionality, you know, that kind of sustains and enhances that. Um, and the interesting thing about Python is that, that was entirely deliberate and intentional. It's not an accidental feature. The very first Python release notes, it says, the Python interpreter is easily extended with new functions and data types implemented in C. And that was true then, and it remains true today. So you might think that, um, you know, that was a natural thing to do. C is kind of ubiquitous, and, and surely, you know, it's just the obvious thing for a language to do. Um, but actually, that's not the case. And if you look at, for example, Ruby, which is a language I've also programmed in, and I must say enjoyed programming in, and you go and search the documentation. Um, I won't read all of this out, but certain words are actually highlighted and others kind of jump out. Huge, undocumented, unintuitive, clunky. You know, whereas the Python API for C is quite well contained, really. It's extremely well documented. Um, you know, I think it's relatively intuitive. It's maybe only a tiny bit clunky. Um, Beyond that, what I want to kind of talk about in my area of expertise and the thing that I would like to uh, encourage you to do, um, given my background, is to interact with that via C++. And, you know, you might ask yourself in 2023, why would I do that? You know, there are clearly other languages around. They have borrow checkers and better haircuts. Um, you know, C++ is kind of sitting there looking, looking a little bit tired. Maybe its genes don't fit so well anymore. Um, and it certainly has had this sort of checkered history. So standardized in 1998, for a long time, it was really used as a slightly sort of enlarged object-oriented language in industry. Um, you know, not so much C with classes, more kind of Java with segmentation faults. Um, <laughs> and then in the last decade or so, suddenly you have this like, flurry of activity some of which is perhaps a little impenetrable from the outside. Um, lots of argument about the type system, lots of new you know, standard library features being implemented, lots of debate about what it can and can't be resolved at compile time. Um, but what I would argue is that in amongst all that, 
what has happened is that this quite subtle and sophisticated modern language has emerged as a subset. You know, for example, you can do uh, generic programming without explicit templates. You can do lots and lots of the things that you could, that you like to do in Python. Like, it's very easy to return tuples of different types. You can bind to them with structured bindings and assign them to different variables. Um, and now with things like ranges, we have zero copy views. You can construct very, very elegant data pipelines that um, kind of express clearly what they want to do. Um, and they're also very efficient. One thing that we make a lot of use of is pattern matching on types. Um, and also being standardized at the moment and available in a library by uh, Michael Park is pattern matching of values. So it's starting to acquire also these kind of Haskell-y type elements that again, you know, they aid you in writing very succinct um, and, you know, sort of almost functional code a long way from the, the sort of bloated object-oriented C++ of the past. The thing that C++ retains is that it is effortlessly close to the machine. Um, this is a website that will be familiar to most C++ programmers and, and maybe to some of you as well, uh, done by a man called uh, Matt Godbolt when he was working at the hedge fund DRW. Um, and this is a compiler explorer. So in real time, you can just write some code, you can choose a compiler, you can see exactly which operations it's going to emit. Um, on the same website, there's also micro benchmarking uh, functionality, which is super useful uh, because one of the problems with micro benchmarking is that the compilers are now very clever. If they detect that your micro benchmarking benchmark doesn't do anything, what they're likely to do is to optimize it completely out of existence. This obviously gives you great performance, but not necessarily the, uh, the information that you were looking for. The main reason that you might want to do this specifically in Python interop is that C++ generic programming is not just present, it's actually pretty awesome. Um, there is really no limit almost to the sensible things that you can do with C++ generic programming. And that's really, really important when you're going from a language that has dynamic typing to a language that has static typing. The risk always is you end up with this massive boilerplate that says, you know, if Python gives me a uint64, I do this. If it's signed, I do this. The same for all the sizes, all the types, floating point. You end up with something that's extremely brittle and extremely too, you know, extremely difficult to modify efficiently. What you can do with C++ is just push that all onto the compiler. You write generic lambdas. You know, it, it, you have some kind of um, variant typing over all the Python types. You just let the compiler emit the object code for it. And it will optimize that, and it will emit the best possible object code it can. Where you need to categorize types, you can actually now do that at compile time with things like const expra. And the really nice thing about that is, again, it gives you that kind of Pythonic behavior where um, if something isn't actually going to be executed, it doesn't actually matter if it makes any sense. In the lower example, if value is an integer, it doesn't matter at all that integer doesn't have a substring function because it will never be called. We know it's, for, uh, it's compile time, it's never gonna be called, so you can just exclude it. You get smaller object code, and you get much more elegant branching over the types. Probably the best selling point for this particular audience. You can also do it in a notebook. Um, Thanks to our friends at Quantstack, uh, there's a beautiful uh, C++ kernel for notebooks called Use Kling that, that relies on the Kling interpreter, um, compiles down to LLVM. You know, between things like the Compiler Explorer, micro benchmarking, you know, notebooks full of C++, you know, there's a really actually quite pleasant experience of, you know, profiling stuff, playing around with it, go and see how fast it is, look at the instructions that are being produced. You know, it's, it's a very, very good way to write optimized code these days. I mean, primi primarily I want to talk about writing C++ extensions in Python, because that's the sort of the thing that I know, and I think that if you want to write, you know, large amounts of code to really shift work from Python, uh, that's probably the best way to do it. But I did want to sort of give a nod to the alternative ways of doing that. Um, the most famous, obviously, is Scython. A lot of you probably know as much, if not more, than me about Scython anyway. Um, it's used both as a way to accelerate Python code, also sometimes as a sort of glue between uh, C++ and, and the world of, of, uh, of you know, C-like languages. Uh, the other two that, that I would just mention briefly are C-types and C-types gen. So these are really for particularly code that you don't own, um, 
targeting functions and, and um, whole libraries independently, and they allow you to access that in a pure Pythonic way, um, you know, without having to add any, any sort of module code. Obviously, what you could do is you could write a module that wraps these, you could link it, um, and then you could expose it yourself. Um, but personally, I like programming, ta programming tasks that are preferable to drinking bleach rather than the other way around. So these give you kind of pure Python access uh, to things that, that you don't have that degree of control over. Another particularly honorable mention goes to, um, I never quite know how to say it, CPPYY, CPPY, maybe someone can tell me. Um, this again uses the Kling interpreter and it allows you from Python to write pure inline C++. Um, I think it's a really, really exciting project and something which is well worth looking at. It's certainly a really, really lightweight way if you just have a small function that you want to optimize, you know, to get started with that. There's no compilation step involved. It just does it all for you. Um, so that's definitely worth a look. But assuming you do want to build some kind of Python extension, what other kind of different ways you can go about it? You can use the C API. It's actually, you know, not terrible. There's a big splurge of code here. Please don't feel obliged to read it. But if you do delve in, you know, it makes sense, and you, know, you kind of override a few things, and it's highly possible. But in 2023, we probably can do a little better than that. Um, one of the quite venerable ways of doing this is, is SWIG. SWIG involves an extra binary step um, that will be familiar to you if you use things like protocol buffers or you know, the Windows world, well, things like MIDL. Um, SWIG is perhaps a little bit behind the others in terms of its C++ support for the standard library, but the, you know, the huge advantage it does have is that it will generate bindings for a whole bunch of languages. You can do Perl, you can do R, there's a whole zoo of different bindings you can, you can generate. So, you know, obviously if that's part of your use case, that's pretty good. But then the real, the modern two, and as you can see, it's already becoming syntactically much, much nicer, are uh, Boost Python. And then the project that we actually use, which is based on Boost Python, uh, started by a guy called Venzel Jacob, um, and now a major open source initiative, and that's called PyBind11. And really between a lot of the modern ones, I think that syntactically they're all fine. You know, you can obviously get up and running. This is everything you need for a Python module that will expose a not particularly useful function to add two numbers together. Uh, you compile this and you can just call it directly from Python. That's all you need. The thing that really differentiates, in my mind, is the marshalling to and from the C++ standard library types, because I'm going to try and encourage you very much you know, to use the C++ standard library, you know, to use the sort of modern C++, and the thing that you don't want to do if you do this is get lost, end up um, you know, kind of trying to implement support for variants or, or things like that. You know, if I have an object that might be a type or nothing, you know, like a non in Python, I just want that to be a standard option in C++ without having to worry about it. If I've got a sum type that might be a whole bunch of types in C++, you know, or non, I want to effortlessly expose that to Python and say, any one of these types is fine, anything else is an error. And PyBind11 really does that extremely well. So, after probably 25 years of writing C++, what's my kind of opinion on how to do it right? Um, and that fundamentally is to use, you know, use the standard types. This is a little bit of code, you know, from a hardcore C++, you know, exposed to Python database. But we're mostly using, you know, relatively common things. We're using shared pointers, we're using vectors, we're using the standard mutex. I think it's very important to kind of steer clear of the temptation to say, I'm writing lower level code now. It's gotta be full of like by hand memory management. It's gotta be full of pointers everywhere. I actually once incidentally rewrote something taking out vector iterators, uh, using pointer iterators, uh, using pointers instead, you know, over contiguous data, it actually got slower, which shouldn't really come as a surprise because it turns out the compiler writers really know what's in the standard library. The standard library authors, they really know how the compilers work. You know, it's generally gonna be the best thing. Having said that, there's another aspect of design for performance, and that's really kind of thinking about the high-level performance behavior, what Martin Thompson calls mechanical symph sympathy, um, and what I've uh, come to call toaster-based design. 
And that's essentially, the computer is a physical device. It has a memory hierarchy. You know, fundamentally, it's, it's something that needs to be plugged into the wall. An awareness of how that works, an awareness of, of the penalties, you know, for us, that often means fast scans happen over contiguous data. The prefetching all does what it wants. The, the you know, processing unit is kept fed, so you're not having data stalls all the time. But the point is, you can do that with vectors. You can, if you want to share it, ha you know, have a shared pointer to a cons vector. That way, the compiler knows it's not going to change. You can share it around. You get that excellent performance behavior. Um, but you also don't have, you know, segmentation faults left, right, and center. Um, a quick zip over things that are, you know are kind of useful to know. Python uh, allocates a huge number of uh, small objects because it tends to box things like integer types. It has its own uh, internal allocator for this reason. It's actually very performant and very good. Um, but, but you know, you do need to abide by Python's rules when you do that. You need to hold the global interpreter lock in the right thread where you're doing that. Um, and I will come to ways of you know, debugging that. Python objects are reference counted. They use a thing called intrusive reference counts, which is actually one of my favorite techniques from C and C++ and is very good. It means that the reference count lives in the object. The things that are shared are just the, the pointer. You go to the object in order to, to um, increment the reference count. This introduces this concept that you'll probably run into called borrowed versus owned refs, which is kind of non-obvious, but all it really means is if you're responsible for keeping that object alive, then you need to increment the reference count when you start with it, and you need to decrement the reference count when you're done with it. Um, and you know, some awareness of how the scope rules in C and C++ works is useful here, because obviously if you're in ex ex enclosing function scope, um, and the outer function is guaranteeing the lifetime of the thing, then you probably don't need to bother. You can just borrow that ref, forget all about the reference counting. As soon as you, as we do, move into an asynchronous world and you're capturing stuff that's going to be executed somewhere else at some later point, then you suddenly need to be very careful that you are actually keeping that alive so that any data you're going to work on is actually there when and where you need it. What can possibly go wrong? Um, like I said, memory management errors, uh, reference counting mistakes. Also, two other things to flag. Python has some global static objects, like non. If the reference count of uh, zero, uh, non falls to zero, um, then Python exits with a SIG abort. You don't want that. Um, PyBind 11 is fantastic in its function resolution. It'll allow you to overload functions in C++. It also does two passes, one without type promotion and again with type promotion. The only thing to flag there is it is strings-based, so if you have a huge number of overloads and some of them rely on type promotion, then it can get kind of slow, so it can be better just to give things different names. Um, there's a huge world of tooling for C++ now. Um, I would encourage using all of them, basically writing it. Without these is a little bit like riding a motorbike without a crash helmet, it's just not a very good idea. Uh, the Clang sanitizers for um, addresses, threading, and undefined behavior, called ASAN, TSAN, and UBSAN. Uh, Valgrind, Python, because it manages its own memory, has uh, a lot of false positives from, uh, from Valgrind, which is a, another memory uh, allocation checker. But if you go to the Python source code, uh, they actually publish their own suppressions file, which will tell you which things are just Python doing what it does and which things are you doing things you ought not to. Um, it's well worth building your own debug version of Python, mostly for bragging rights. It just sounds epic if you could say, I built my own debug version of Python with all of the uh, reference count checking on. Um, and also because it's actually really, really easy. You grab the code, you set the debug flag, you build it. I've done it on loads of environments. It never seems to have any problems. The one thing to be aware of is it's because of the reference count checking, which is one of the most useful features, it's not binary compatible. So if you use NumPy as well, you'll need to build a, a debug NumPy. But that's also, like, that's super easy. Um, static code analysis tools. Uh, the Sonar people are here. I use Sonar Lint. I think that's great. There's a load of other really good ones that you can use for free. CPP check. There's Facebook Infer. Things get, you know, even more complicated if you want to go out there and, and spend some money. So, the point is, if you want to do this, you basically want to get performance. That's the reason why you would, you would bother, fundamentally. First thing to be aware of is, good as these frameworks are, marshalling data from C++, C++ to Python, from Python to C++ is not free. These represent the first and second run timings. 
comparing the raw C++ speed, you can see that it gets better on the second run. Um, but really what you want to do is you want to take a large volume of data in Python. You want to pass it over without copying as much as possible. You want to do a, you know, a big chunk of work, and then you want to pass that back again. On the way in, ideally what you want to do is not copy, but steal pointers. This is a little bit of code from our public GitHub, where we're really doing some black magic stuff to, um, you know, to steal NumPy pointers. We're getting the strides, the dimensions out. The whole point of this is that if we're writing data, we don't want to kind of copy it and then pass that to the compressor. We just want to grab the pointer, pass it direct through to the compressor. You know, every stage something is happening. It's, it's being compressed, it's being written to the storage. Same thing on the way out. Took me a while to find this really interesting bit of uh, code in NumPy. If you pass an object in from Python, a base object, and you have an array, you can actually manage the lifetime of that just by setting the base object pointer on it. It's completely zero copy. If you don't do that, what you go through is the PyArray new copy uh, method, and that can be a little bit problematic because you know if you've got a million rows and you've got sort of 5,000 columns, that's a gigantic amount of mem copying. You know, it could be two or maybe three orders of magnitude difference in the time it takes to do those. The other thing you want to do, which is kind of related, is where you do need to allocate Python objects, which if you're doing it in Python is gonna be serial, you're gonna to have to get the global interpreter locked, you're gonna to have to hold it for the duration of allocating those objects in the right thread. You wanna do that as late as possible. You wanna kind of, you know, if you're aggregating, make that result set as small as you possibly can, and then only at the point where you've really kind of got an answer do you pass that back to Python. This is actually some code where um, keeping an internal C++ uh, map, a high performance map of Python pointers so that we can increment their ref counts, managing memory and also increasing the speed at which we can allocate Python strings. Uh, beyond that, if you want to get into the really magic stuff, uh, you can do Python arena allocation. I wish I could say that I invented this. I actually thought of it independently, but then I discovered this really cool project called Quelling Blade, which with a, by a guy with a completely unpronounceable GitHub name. Um, which actually goes a little bit further and it allows you not just to arena allocate Py objects in C++, it actually allows you to register Python objects as being arena allocatable from within Python. Uh, it's a work in progress at the moment, but definitely one to, one to keep an eye on. I have no idea who you are, but, but hats off. Um, and I guess the main thing beyond that is, you know, guesswork-based optimization almost never works really well. Um, you know, you need to measure. These are Brendan Gregg's flame graphs. You know, you can kind of get the perf input. You can drill down. You can really see what's actually happening. Uh, so what have we done with that? Um, ArcticDB is a, is a columnar uh, Python-centric database. It stores data frames. It's particularly adaptive for time series. It's really taking all of that knowledge that I've gleaned over those 20 years of working on kind of big server-based uh, databases and it's creating something which is just in the Python process and on a storage which can be disk, it can be you know, in the cloud, you can talk directly to S3. Um, it's extremely fast at doing uh, selections. So this is 100,000 columns, um, 100,000 rows, 10 billion values. Um, what we want to do is to pl pluck out three columns, 100 rows each from those 10 billion values. I'm doing this on a pretty rubbish uh, Jupyter Notebook. It has one virtual core, it has eight gig of RAM. I can still do it in around a fifth of a second. Uh, beyond that, it has a lot of features that you might expect from a, from a database. Um, in addition to which, you can, you can rewind, you can keep the whole history of everything you've ever written. Um, it does filtering. You can project columns on the fly with a sort of intuitive pandas-like uh, data syntax. You can, you can do group by aggregations, um, you know, time series aggregations are coming soon, so bucketed aggregations and things like that. Um, the Python data science world is, is obviously changing. Uh, the Apache Arrow standard is becoming a de facto standard for, for data interchange. Um, it allows you to go to things like, like Rust, you know, Rust uh, to Polars. We're just finishing off our, our support for Apache Arrow. Also, Pandas 2 is coming along. Pandas 2 has, you know, has Pi Arrow support. Um, it's also something that, that is, is happening at the moment um, in, in uh, Arctic DB. So yes, I hope that I've um, encouraged you to take a little bit look of a look uh, below the surface uh, and maybe have a little play around with it 
uh, yourselves. If you'd like to have a play around with Arctic DB, it's, it's available. Uh, it's source available on GitHub. You can pip install, you can conda install, and I would encourage you to, to give it a look and tell us what you think. Thank you very much. Thanks for the amazing talk, William. He may have stolen some audience for CPPCon. <laughs> <laughs> we have some time for Q&A, so please use the mic if you want to ask. Hi, just vaguely related. Um, I haven't written C++ since like high school, and I wanted to ask maybe for advice if I want to go the other way around. What's the simplest way to embed Python in C++ C++ code, like without hassle? Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, in the same original release notes uh, that Guido wrote, he said that that was also the intention. Um, actually, PyBind 11 will allow you to do that. So you can embed the Python interpreter in C++ C++ if you want to do that. Um, yeah, it provides both functions. Um, generally, one or the other, both is at the same time. Is, it gets kind of messy, but yeah, um, it's, it's easily done. Thank you. And like, can't walk. Everybody looking at me walking in here. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, one of the advantages, I guess, of using C or C++ in Python is that it's much faster. But um, how does it work when it's like you show examples of um, pure C, C++ code in, embedded in the Python code? I guess it needs to be compiled. Does it compile every time you run it? Does it have something more clever? Because obviously that would slow it down. It doesn't get all the advantages. Yeah, so one of the slides was actually comparing, if I flick back, if I can find it. Um, this compares the first and second run times. Uh, the third line is CPPYY. So you can see that there is actually a kind of an upfront cost. And then that's, you know, that's amortized to so it, some extent. But I think that's really going to depend somewhat on you know, how complex the code you're compiling is. Um, I, I'm not you know, completely familiar with, with the CPPYY internals, but I think there is some degree of caching there. Can you pre-compile it? I don't know. I would have to honestly say I don't think so. I think the just-in-time compilation is, is kind of the point, and if you wanted to go to you know, pre-compile, then you would just use a C++ compiler. Thank you. Hi. You mentioned weird language with borrow checkers. Uh, early in your talk, and this was all about uh, interoperability with C++. So have you any experience with this weird language with borrow checker and integrating it into Python, or what is your opinion on that? Uh, sorry, what was, can you repeat the question? <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll stop being so ubiquitous. And, uh, you mentioned Rust. Yes, Rust. And that it is not so easily uh, interoperable. So have you tried it, or? Uh, I've tried it a little bit. I think it's... I think it's improving. Um, I think, I guess, I still think that there is a place for C++. You know, I think particularly in the maturity of the generics, um, I think that, you know, Rust is a very elegant language. Um, my feeling is that the thing that I like about C++ is that, that the lifetime of objects in memory is sort of terminus with their lifetime within the application. And so, Yes, it's true that if you don't get the kind of stuff correct in C++, you tend to get you know, segmentation faults and whatever. But actually, those are quite well-handled problems. And whilst ensuring memory safety is a brilliant thing, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that your program, you know, your program as I'm sure you all know, just because you have memory safety, it doesn't mean that what you're doing is going to be correct. It's still possible to kind of get it wrong. Um, and sometimes having those things kind of co-extensive makes it easier because it's very easy to check uh, memory lifetimes and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I'm sure that Rust is going to grow as a language, and I'm sure that the Python interop is going to develop. It's, it's not bad at the moment. The other thing is that you know, C++ is literally a superset of C, and you know, C Python is written in C, so there's this ease of working with a C API that is hard to rival, I think. Yeah, that's pretty much in my view. Thank you. Uh, thank you, William. Uh, we are just out of time now, so if you have any more questions, you can ask the speaker later outside. And thanks again. Thank you very much.